Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Walking is a simple activity. It's known to improve health and get us from point A to point B. Martha Teichner introduces us to Neil King Jr., an author who took walking a step further, actually trekking from Washington DC to New York City, an endeavor that became a profound and spiritual journey. After a career as a Wall Street Journal reporter, the walk was his way of contemplating America, past and present, and at 61, his own life, after surviving esophageal cancer. I was off to do something that was very pure and basic, which was just to notice things and immerse myself in a, in a walk through one spring. That had, had kind of cleansed my eyes in some ways, or my spirit. Later in the show, Neil King Jr. on the history he encountered along the way. It's almost as if your constant traveling companion was history. It was because I encountered aspects of the Civil War. I encountered some of the earliest railroad beds that we had built, the canals that had been dug during that whole spree of canal digging, you know, all of the tumult of the Revolutionary War. I passed George Washington's path probably 20 times. And, you know, I spent a whole day at Valley Forge, and that was a great place to meditate on how and when we decide to understand or memorialize them. So it was a lot of um, walking through our past. I mean, that's a rich, rich um, stretch of territory. Decades before Neil King Jr. set off on foot, Bruce Lee forged his own path of a different kind. The Asian American action star and martial arts pioneer faced harsh discrimination during his Hollywood career. But as Jonathan Vigliotti discovered, he still influences movies today. I would say every action film that's being made today, everyone's striving still to do what he did. Justin Lin is a Taiwanese American filmmaker. His movies, which include several from the Fast and Furious franchise, have grossed more than $2 billion. There was something that was very authentic in his sequences, in his films. It's these moments where unabashedly they just cut to his close-up. And he's not saying anything, but he's saying everything. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Neil King Jr. was looking for a slower pace when he set off on an ambitious 330-mile walk. Taking mostly back roads, he rediscovered American history and questioned who gets remembered and why. Martha Teichner followed in his footsteps. In March 2021, Neil King Jr. left his home in Washington, D.C. and went for a walk. King would walk 330 miles, all the way to New York City. It would take him 26 days. He retraced his steps with us heading off down the mall with the U.S. Capitol at his back. Did you feel the weight of who we are now and what we are as a country as you set forth? Yeah, very much so. I mean, this is the front yard, the nation's front yard, and it just seemed like the perfect place to start this walk. Just weeks after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, after a year of COVID. Walking through my first covered Amish bridge. What King experienced along the way, sticking to back roads, would become a book, American Ramble. I had set out with a wonder first stirred by a sickness. A jolt of fear had opened a seam of freedom, and I had slipped through. After a career as a Wall Street Journal reporter, the walk was his way of contemplating America, past and present, and at 61, his own life, after surviving esophageal cancer. I was off to do something that was very pure and basic, which was just a notice things and immerse myself in a, in a walk through one spring that it had kind of cleansed my eyes in some ways or my spirit. You'll see the exact line between Maryland and Pennsylvania, the Mason-Dixon line. It runs right through the middle of this incredible 19th century German farm. The Mason-Dixon line, 
until after the Civil War, the dividing line between slavery and freedom. King asked himself, whose history gets forgotten and who's remembered? Who are the memory keepers? In the 1700s, it was a mill and a farm. In the Up the road in York, Pennsylvania, he visited Michael Helfrich, the mayor. In the 1920s, you had the uh, migration of African Americans up from Bamberg, South Carolina. But by the 1950s and 1960s, uh, the, the great fathers of the community decided it was a ghetto, and they used the uh, first use of eminent domain to wipe out the entire neighborhood. What do they want to put in instead? You're standing in it, a park, and then to add insult to injury, they took half of the park and gave it to the industry next door for a parking lot and a new building. The much older Cookus House, built in 1741, barely escaped demolition. That is Thomas Paine right there. And Helfrick lives in it and has turned it into a shrine to founding father Thomas Paine, who stayed here during the Revolutionary War. We have here our Underground Railroad conductors. Across town, King met another of York's memory keepers, Samantha Dorm. We have United States Colored Troops. I believe we have about 32 um, that fought during the Civil War. Dorm leads the restoration of York's long-neglected African-American Lebanon Cemetery. Since 2019, our volunteer group coming out here, we've uncovered over 800 of the flat markers. The point is to rescue the stories of lives. It makes a difference when you're learning about people who not only look like you, but who are related to you and to be able to say, I come from greatness. I know now that I'm related to over 100 individuals on this land alone of my family. Time became a thing that awed Neil King. This is one of the oldest rivers in the world. It's like the fifth oldest river in the world. It's 320 million years or something, way older than the Nile. As he made his way along the Susquehanna River, with Paul Nevin. We have all these different tracks in here. Whose passion is these Native American petroglyphs, possibly a thousand years old. There's a bird track here. We have, this is a little infant-sized uh, human footprint here. And then this is like a serpent would make, a creepy crawly. As King walked, Time seemed to slow down and then stop altogether as he found himself among Pennsylvania's Mennonites. He chanced upon this. And then this. Well, the serendipity was the, was the magic. And I met, you know, at so many great people that I almost felt were put there by some higher power to, to interact with me. He drifted from the ethereal to the concrete, to the very real world of everything his walk was not. I have arrived at where I've wanted to come, which is the heart of darkness itself. That is to say, the Jersey Turnpike, I-95, the main artery of commerce for the United States of America. Time took on new meaning as he toured the final resting place of some of that commerce, New Jersey's Middlesex County Landfill, with Brian Murray, the man who runs it. We tip about uh, 1,600 tons of garbage a day, and last year we buried somewhere around just shy of about 540,000 tons of garbage. On top of an astonishing garbage mountain that will rise another 12 feet this year. We're walking through a whole scale of time, a measure of time. Where and are we right here? I think we're like the early 60s, maybe the late 50s. So end of the Eisenhower administration, basically. And up there is today. And this bridge right there. A depressing return to now? No. 
As King crossed the Bayonne Bridge, he spotted his destination, Manhattan. I was just sort of overwhelmed. It was like I was hit by a, a wave of elation, rapture, a full body sense of elation. It wasn't like the city was some new thing, but I had, my eyes had been renewed in a way. A day later, Neil King Jr.'s American Ramble ended at the Ramble in New York Central Park, a twisted network of paths that reminded him of the complexity of the country he had sampled. You know, in the end, I think the walk, despite all the kind of gloomy thoughts that you can have about various episodes from our history and our past, uh, left me a lot more optimistic in a way about our future than um, had been the case when I walked out the door. To find gratitude and joy at three miles an hour, traveling light. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from our chat with Neil King Jr., something you can only see right here on CBS News Streaming. Stay with us. We do create the environment that we walk into in the way that we walk into it. As promised, here's more from Martha Teichner and Neil King Jr. Why walk? It was very much about the slowness of it and the going back to a previous time. You know, it wasn't until the railroad disrupted our lives dramatically in the 18, late 1820s and 1830s that for the whole rest of our history, we'd essentially moved at the same pace. Nothing had ever really dramatically altered that pace. And then suddenly we're moving at 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 miles an hour. As opposed and to three miles an hour. Three miles an hour, yeah. And, you know, as I found so quickly, the difference between walking and driving might be 20 times, a factor of 20, but the richness of what you're seeing and detecting and encountering is hundreds of times beyond that. You're literally not in the same place. Um, you know, the cars that are going by you are technically <laughs> in the same place as you are when they pass you, but it's just, they're just not in the same world. And the difference between those two experiences really became quite profound as I went. It's almost as if your constant traveling companion was history. It was, because I encountered aspects of the Civil War. I encountered some of the earliest railroad beds that we had built, the canals that had been dug during that whole spree of canal digging, you know, all of the tumult of the Revolutionary War. I passed George Washington's path probably 20 times. And, you know, I spent a whole day at Valley Forge, and that was a great place to meditate on how and when we decide to understand or memorialize them. So it was a lot of um, walking through our past. I mean, that's a rich, rich um, stretch of territory. You talk in the book about two things that really struck me. In one part, you talk about the capacity that we have to create our own reality. And the other thing you say, how you go out searching for meaning and you get more meaning by way of what meaning you bring yeah. to the process. Yeah. Those two ideas, um, how did that play in? You know, there was a fascinating thing with the walk where I was interested in um, how I would be received in places by people and what kind of welcoming there would be and to what extent I would feel when I walked into someone's barn or up their driveway, what I, whether I felt that I belonged there but or whether they gave me the sense of belonging. And it, it really kind of dawned on me all the more that I'm not saying there's not a fixed reality out there because there is um, in some ways, but on the other hand, we do create the environment that we walk into in the way that we walk into it. And I think one of the reasons that um, I formed the kind of bonds with the people that I did along this walk was because I was, during this stretch of time, uncommonly receptive and uncommonly mm -hmm. open to them. And because of that, I think they responded to me in kind. And that kind of, you create the reality that you walk into, when you walk into a room, you change that room by walking into it. And the way that you come in, the frame of mind that you have walking into it, creates a lot of the atmosphere of that room and how people are going to receive you. And I think that's just a really important element. Up next, Bruce Lee's enduring role. Welcome back. 
Bruce Lee helped popularize martial arts in the movies, even combining several disciplines to create his own style. More than 50 years after his untimely death, filmmakers are still inspired by his trademark moves and the wisdom behind them. Here's Jonathan Vigliotti. In Los Angeles' Chinatown, there stands a bronze figure like no other in America. When we say Bruce Lee was larger than life, I can't think of a better <laughs> example than this statue. I think it's such a beautiful tribute. This is the only Bruce Lee statue in the United States. His daughter, Shannon Lee, says it captures his strength and dignity. My father represents what's possible, like what is possible for a human being. Martial artist, actor, writer, thinker. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now, Bruce Lee broke cold, barriers and bridged cultures. The water, my friend. A legacy that endures half a century after his tragic death at 32. Yes, he was just 32 years old. There is just no place where people don't know who he is, mm. don't have affection for him. So many people from so many walks of life all over the globe. And his life was amazing. Born in San Francisco in 1940, Lee grew up in Hong Kong and was in films at a very early age. His first movie role was as an infant. <laughs> <laughs> and he made 18, 20 films up to the age of 18. <laughs> He was also perfecting his own martial arts style, combining combat, self-defense, and philosophy, and began teaching it after moving to Seattle. A 1964 skills demonstration Test X2, take one speed. led to this, this remarkable ball. screen test. Start off. Auditioning for the part of Kato in the TV series The Green Hornet, Lee displayed his trademark kicks, jabs, and punches. He won the role, but faced discrimination as an Asian American in Hollywood. As the scripts were coming out, they would give him the lines to work on, but there were no lines. It was sort of like, hello, you know, yes. The Green Hornet lasted only one season, but Lee was a breakout star, and in the coming years would appear in a string of films showcasing his extraordinary talents. I would say every action film that's being made today, everyone's striving still to do what he did. Justin Lin is a Taiwanese-American filmmaker. His movies, which include several from the Fast and Furious franchise, have grossed more than $2 billion. There was something that was very authentic in his sequences, in his films. It's these moments where unabashedly they just cut to his close-up. And he's not saying anything, but he's saying everything. I've been collecting for over uh, 50 years. And for Jeff Chin, Bruce Lee changed everything. I actually grew up being ashamed of my Chinese heritage because of all the negative stereotype that you see in movies, TV, even comic books. Jin owns one of the largest collections of Lee memorabilia. This is an uh, original weight bench and dumbbells that Bruce Lee used. Currently on display at the Chinese Historical Society in San Francisco. He says he was bullied at school for being Asian American. I got picked on, I got called every racial slur in the book. So I was basically on, on my own. That is, he says, until his father put this on his bedroom wall. And I looked at the poster and then I was crying. And then it was almost like Bruce Lee was speaking to me, saying, it's okay, Jeff, because I, Bruce Lee, am, am Chinese American and I want you to be proud of your heritage. That poster was from the film Fist of Fury. Lee would make just one more movie, Enter the Dragon. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Before his life was cut short from a cerebral edema, a swelling of the brain, in 1973. You were four years old when your father passed away. Mm -hmm. The thing that I remember about him the most, far and away the most, is how he felt and how I felt in his presence. 
Shannon spoke about the death of her father and her brother, Brandon Lee, who died when a prop gun discharged during the filming of the 1993 movie, The Crow. Loss, like the loss of my father and the loss of my brother, is traumatizing. It's traumatizing to the spirit and the body um, and the soul. And I have to really acknowledge my father's philosophies for helping me to get through those times. My dad loved to meditate. It helped him to sort of clear his mind. She carries on Bruce Lee's mission from camps that instill confidence in children to developing a story he hoped to bring to the screen. It's called The Warrior, a martial arts crime drama that she and Justin Lin are producing for Max. For me, it was very personal. I had heard the story that Bruce Lee actually came up with the idea that ultimately became Kung Fu. And when he pitched it to the studios, they loved it, but they realized that they can't cast an Asian American to play an Asian American role. So that's how David Carradine got the role. And so I felt like it was important to try to finish what he started. And it's what Bruce Lee started that guides so many people today. What would your father say if he were here? What would your father's message be? I think he would try to encourage everybody to see each other as human beings first. You know, we all may have subtle differences, but those differences should be celebrated. We all want the same things, to be safe, to be loved, to be seen. We all want that. He said it himself, under the heavens, under the sky, we're all one family. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.